streaming live via the internet, welcome to ISP Radio, your weekly source for ISP-related news, events, and interviews with industry experts. If you deliver internet via fiber optic, fixed wireless, coax, or any other way, you're in the right place. And now a brief word from our sponsors. Link Technologies Incorporated provides the lowest priced Microtech products in North America, as well as Wade Towers, Mimosa, Cambium, Ubiquity, Nettonics, and a host of other products and services to be your one-stop shop for your ISP needs. Visit www.linktext.net. That's L-I-N-K-T-E-C-H-S dot net for more information. TowerCoverage.com, providing online RF coverage maps with website integration. Stop rolling your truck for every site survey and start doing installations. Visit www.towercoverage.com now. And now we'd like to present our hosts, Steve Grabiel and Dennis Burgess. Welcome to another edition of ISP Radio. I'm your host, Steve Grabiel, broadcasting from my office in Moriarty, New Mexico, and Dennis Burgess is producing and co-hosting the show from St. Louis, Missouri. Boy, the weather out here is crazy. Um, I thought a tower I was looking at it just now. I thought a tower blew over that we just put up, and it's just uh, Air Fiber 11's got pushed out of uh, alignment. So hopefully tomorrow I can get those fixed. We've had a really crazy past six months uh from the last show we had uh been kicked off of a water tank uh from a private utility company and had to build a tower pretty quick uh by the end of january and we did get that all taken care of we got evicted from two tank sites and we got our equipment off of that but we were able to salvage the majority of the network that was a good thing, and just crazy wet weather out here. There's snow and predicted 60 to 70 mile an hour winds out here. I just hope my stuff stands up to that wind. What's it like going on in your neck of the woods, Dennis? Yeah, it's basically the same thing, man. It is cold and nasty. Uh, I think the high. Actually, it's not too bad here. It's like 60 today, so it's not horrible if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. You know, but otherwise we've been doing really, really good. Um, you know, we've had some cold. Uh, we've had some, uh, you know, wind and rain. Actually, it's supposed to storm here later on today. Uh, but, uh, you know how that kind of stuff works. Um, for the most part, we don't even operate a, a network anymore, so we don't really have to worry about, you know, we can do the rain dance for everybody else to sell them gear, right? <laughs> oh, really? So yeah. Jim no longer has his wisp? No, no, yeah, he, he sold that, and, uh, so it's off onto the other company, and all is good. How's that? Cool. So you guys focus totally on link techs, huh? Yep. Yep. That's uh, that's really the big goal that we had uh, to to focus on link technologies and such. So, uh, you know, we've been doing that pretty well for the past couple of years. So it's just it, it's just another you know it's a little different, but not really that much different. But at any which rate, we've been uh, really busy, uh, especially with all the microtech announcements and uh, all the uh, bugs and and stuff like that. Uh, we've really picked up in the past, I'd say, uh, you know, I don't know, month-ish or so. Uh, February was, was really busy, which is really good because, I mean, we, we need to stay busy. Uh, we're selling a lot of hardware just like everything else. So, you know, uh, uh, typically January is not the, the, the blockbuster month, if that makes sense. It's not a, a super busy because most people, they're like, uh... I would buy a whole bunch of stuff from you, but I don't really need it right this second, so I'm not going to spend the money to to buy it. Which right, I understand. And they it bought can't. it all last year at expense. Yeah, yeah, you know, there, I, I, you can't really argue about it, but it is what it is at that point. So, so you mentioned some uh, product updates and Microtech stuff, and the mums coming up here soon, or has that already have been had? No, no, that's coming up. That's coming up. So, uh, stuff coming up. How is that? We'll we'll kind of go over that. Um, one, we have uh, Wisp America. Next week, uh, literally, I'm going to leave on Monday. Uh, everything starts basically on Tuesday and uh, goes through Thursday, uh, and then I'll come back on, on Friday. Uh, I'll be giving three sessions there. Uh, I have an IPv6 session. I have a BGP, uh, BGP black hole session uh, and a MPLS session. Uh, that I will be uh, uh, a speaker with. I'm not going to be the presenter, or I'm not going to be the the moderator, uh, and I'm not going to be the 
um, what's the right word? I'm not. You'll be on the panel. Yeah, I'm just going to be on a panel. Just just another speaker here, uh, and such. Uh, so you know, that's that's all good. There's definitely not a problem with that. I just need to make sure that every you know everybody knows what's going on and, and stuff like that. So you can look at wispa.org for all the details uh, inside that, as far as uh, who's going where. Uh, when the sessions are, wispa.org. They also have their Groupio app. We're still going to be using that this year, uh, or at least at this show anyway, uh, for mobile applications. So uh, really good stuff there as well. Um, then the following week, you're going to have to give me a sec here. I'm going to have to uh, actually uh, move our... Are correct um so that's that uh the week after uh not for the u.s market but for the canadian market we have can wisp uh which is their big uh, uh yearly show and then the following week april uh third through well fourth through the fifth for the most part is the microtech mum and that is in austin texas uh so literally i'm i'm gonna be gone three weeks <laughs> Uh, you know, of course, important things going on here as well, but you know how that kind of good stuff works. So, yeah, uh, you know, really good stuff going on with all those types of things. So we just have to, uh, you know, keep keep it all uh, all together, which, uh, you know, it's going to be it'll be good. You know what I'm saying? You'll get you'll get through uh, April. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once we get through April, we should be we should be uh, golden, if that makes sense. So, mm-hmm. uh you know, and then uh, you know the Microtech Mum. Obviously, that is a it's a it's kind of a big deal because we currently have uh, lots and lots of uh, data kind of floating around. And actually, that was something else I was going to bring up uh, as soon as I can find the the presentation. Uh, I was going to pull up the Microtech presentation and let everybody see the new products and uh, uh, see what's going on because. Now they have changed their their events to where uh, the European mum is literally a week or two before the U.S. mum, and that is the the one that uh, you know basically er- that they announce all their new products at. Um, if you are a follower to Link Technologies Inc. on Facebook, uh, you should have already gotten the video from that as well as the presentation because we already did uh, all that. Uh, and put it out on Facebook. So if not, if not, go like face uh, or go find uh, Link Technologies Incorporated or Inc. and uh, uh, you know join us or like us, and uh, that way you can get all of our updates uh, and such as well. Uh, and as soon as I get to that page, I will uh, be pulling the PDF up. Here it comes. Uh, that has all this uh, this data. So. Here we go. Um, but that's that's basically the, what's going on in the next three th- three or four weeks. Uh, I do know there's some other uh, uh, shows going on, stuff like that, but I don't know uh, you know who or what or where and uh, that type of stuff. So I really right. wouldn't, really wouldn't. Uh, I, I'm not that worried about those types of things if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So uh, otherwise, you know, we're just uh, we're just uh, keeping busy here. Well, tell us about some of the new stuff for the software patches that uh, has been going on with Microtech. Well, yep. Well, I'm going to pull up, uh, maybe, <laughs> if my uh, presentation was... Uh... Did you present at the European Mum? Uh, I did not. I did not attend that, and mostly that is simply due to the fact that, uh, to be... To be honest it's just that i did not want to have i didn't really want to go <laughs> to to the to the mum uh i mean it is a long trip to to fly over there uh i'm sure most people understand that and uh so you know it it is what it is in that particular case so i did not present i did not go or, uh, over to the european mum uh, I did watch it live just so uh, we knew what was going on, but uh, that's about it. You know, not mm-hmm. not to uh, we didn't get you know super carried away with the uh, the mum, uh, if that makes sense. So, 
Um, at any which rate, I'm going to uh, get into their their presentation, and uh, this is actually they actually gave a good presentation. Um, as soon as I get to the product updates, um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to that. So, uh, one thing that they do have is the LHG LTE, and this does work with uh, T-Mobile, uh, AT&T, and Verizon. It does not contain all the bands that all of those guys actually need, uh, if that makes sense. So you're not going to get the fastest possible speed, but uh, it will work very well. Uh, it actually has a 17.5 uh, dB gain directional antenna, which is unheard of in the LTE market uh, and such. Um, that product is already out. Uh, we already have those. Um, the LTAP, this is a uh, small... A mobile device. It is really designed for like mounting in cars, things like that. Uh, it has three SIM slots with too many PCIe's, so you can actually have up to three providers uh, configured on side one unit. Uh, it has GPS, built-in Wi-Fi. Uh, it has multiple power sources, so it actually has USB. Uh, it actually has po a power connector, a, a regular uh, a barrel connector. It also has a, a plug on it that you can actually use to uh, a little four pin that you can plug in, so it'll run off D DC car that type of stuff. Uh, it does have SMA connectors for the antennas as well. So um, that one was actually announced last year, and it's still coming. They still say it's it's soon, uh, but they didn't really give us a, a time. Um, the CCR 1036 and the 1016s, not the 1009s, the 1036s and 1016s only. Those will all have the uh, same price point, but they all will have dual power supplies in them uh, starting uh, basically now. We, we pretty much already have those in stock. Um, they'll all have the dual power supplies. They'll have a full-size USB port, which... I don't really use that too terribly much. Um, they also have uh, an optional 48-volt power supply uh, that we do, I believe, we have in stock with at, at Link Technologies. So if you need a, a CCR that needs to run 48-volt, uh, we can do that, and it can have redundant power. Um, these are pretty much the same power supplies that the 1072s use, so they're not really uh, duplicating part numbers, if that makes sense. Um, the next thing we have is the CRS 326 uh, 24S 2Q Plus. Um, this was announced last year at the last year's uh, Europe Mum. Uh, this is still coming. They do not have a date. Uh, actually, they may have a date right below it, but um, this product is still coming out. Uh, they're still stating that it's going to be available hopefully in Q3 in 2019. Um, this gives you 24 SFP Plus. 10 gig ports and two QSFP uh, 40 giggy ports. Wow. Now, previously, last year, they actually announced it as a 32S Plus. So it had 32 uh, 10 gigs on it, but the problem was is that they're like, well, where, where's the uplink going to come from? Or the downlink, whatever you want to call it. So I think they, they just decided that they needed to make that product change, and uh, that, uh, that's a product that is going to be coming out uh, in Q3 of 2019. Um, next, we have the CRS-312. We actually get quite a few requests for these. Um, this is the 4C8XG, and what this product is, um, is it is a 8-10-gig uh, copper interface. Okay, so you can look up the 10 gig. You basically need Cat 7 to run 10 gig, etc. But basically, it gives you eight uh, 10 gig ports, and then it gives you uh, four combo ports. And the combo ports are either SFP or copper. So again, if you need to run 10 gig over copper inside your office network, you can definitely do that with this product. Um, they are saying that's going to be available in Q2 this year. Uh, so second quarter this year. Um, again, as soon as they're available, we're going to be ordering them. Uh, it's just a matter of Microtech making it available, uh, which you know is, of course, a, a <laughs> different thing sometimes. Um, next, we're going to have the big bad boy. They showed this sucker off last year at the European MUM uh, as well as the uh, U.S. MUM. 
It's the uh, CRS 354-48G, 4S, and 2Q+. Plus. So four 10-gig uh, SFPs, two 40-gig QSFPs, and 48 copper interfaces, which is a uh, pretty much the most, for the most part, that you can actually put on there. It does have a uh, management port, uh, as well as a council port as well. Uh, so I guess they could add one more gigabit port, but there you go. Um, this is expected, uh, again, they announced it last year, but it's expected fourth quarter this year. There is going to be a 48P version, which is a 48-port PoE out version. Uh, I don't know what anybody needs 48 ports for other than phone systems, um, especially at the size of the switch. I mean, it is it is a big switch, as it should be, because 48 PoE out ports, uh, that's a lot of wattage. So you just have to keep that in mind. But uh, they are expecting to have a 48 port of that. So now we're going to go into uh, Microtech's product plan for 2019. And to be honest with you, um, they did not do a really good job at covering what some of these are. So, uh, Steve, you've heard of GPON, right? Yes. Okay. So GPON, for those of you that don't know, is gigabit uh, fiber optic internet. So it's a single strand fiber optic internet that can be split with splitters as it goes down the line, uh, usually up to 64 or 128 times typically 64, um, you get about a, a gig and a half downstream total, but everybody's sharing the bandwidth, okay? So you're not getting, there is a, a, uh, a 10 gig E GPON, uh, but that is stupid priced at this point in time. Um, so we're not really seeing a whole lot of 10 gig GPON, um, but Microtech, uh, and, and a lot of everybody said, oh, I'm interested in GPON. Well, this is not GPON, this is G. Pen. So it's spelled G-P-E-N. And what it is is Gigabit uh, Passive Ethernet Network. So uh, they have this wonderful chart. And basically what you can do is you can use a splitter and you can use a, uh, obviously everybody's used to GPON. You typically go into the ONT, which is the client side. You go to a splitter and then that optical cable goes back to the central office. Okay. This is the Gigabit Passive Ethernet Network, so uh, 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 again, uh, GPEN. So when we go to that, we actually have to very first solve a major problem that you have with Gigabit Ethernet Networks, and that is 99.9 .9 of them go about 100 meters, right? So that's about 300 foot. Uh, I mean, that, that's pretty much industry standard, roughly. Uh, I have done more than that, but it doesn't really go too much more, and you get quite a, f quite a bit of voltage loss. So what they have is they have this thing called the GPER, or the G-P-E-R, G-P-E-R, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is a super low-cost gigabit passive Ethernet repeater. Now, what's really, it's, it's basically just a two-port PoE device okay that takes power in takes just a little bit of, of of wattage very very low wattage and then injects and possibly even ups the voltage a little bit uh as it goes across so the difference is now it is possible by using multiple of these to almost go if you put uh 57 volts in okay which is not standard uh, uh poe but if you put 50 7 volts or 56 volts into the very first one, you could actually extend your cable up to 1.5 kilometers or roughly a mile. So think about that. You're going from 100 meters to uh, or 300 feet to a mile in that's just standard using standard uh, Cat5 cable. Oh, wow. Okay. So instead of running, one of the big problems we have with GPON is splitters. And then all the fiber uh, terminations. So you have to have a lot of, uh, you have to have a fusion splicer or you have to have someone do that stuff for you. Um, with this, you can go up to uh, a mile without uh, uh, losing gigabit Ethernet connectivity. At least that's what they're, they're claiming anyway. Uh, again, these products are not available as of yet to the distributors, so just so you know. 
Uh, they also have a GESP. This is a gigabit Ethernet surge protector. Uh, this, again, basically would go at either end before it goes into your server room or uh, telecom booth. Uh, as well as right before the customer side. Uh, gives you gigabit Ethernet surge suppression up to uh, 30kV. Uh, very, very low-cost device. Do you guys have that in stock? No. no, no. All, okay. these, all these new products that I'm, uh, I'm basically stating now, the original products that we started with... Are they planned with, forward? Yeah, the, the original products was products that was announced last year, and now we're into products that... Uh, are being announced that literally this year and, uh, to my knowledge, has not been made available for Microtech. Some of these may be available, but I, I, we have not got them yet. Okay? Um, so just uh, we'll have to go from there. Um, give me a sec here. Let me see. Give me a sec. All right. So... Uh, so we have the the Ethernet surge suppressor, which is really good that Microtech's making that. Next, we have the G-PIN. So this is your passive Ethernet network uh, injector. So basically, we have a, a G-PIN 11. So they're going to make two models, a G-PIN 11 and a G-PIN 21. PoE injector, the G-PIN 11 uh, gives you the PoE injected and can be mounted securely. Uh, it's a very, very basic box. Basically, you bring power, uh, Ethernet and power into it, and then it has PoE out uh, as well. We also have a smart injector, a G-PIN 21, that adds an SFP port for fiber or uh, to copper functionality. So if you need to run uh, uh, fiber, you can. Um, Honestly, the, the G-PIN is kind of part of that G-PIN network. Uh, it, it would be basically at the, the customer premise to inject power into that uh, Ethernet cable so that the Ethernet cable can run back uh, again. Um, I actually talked to them uh, about, what about injecting power the other way, and they're like, well, you can do that, but then what happens if you lose power at that site? Then, then everything loses power. Which does make sense. Um, so they designed it to where each individual home would inject power into their individual cable. And that's actually going to come into the next product, which is kind of odd, but it does make sense based on what I just said. And this is what they did not explain in the, the, the MUM presentation. So they also are making a CRS 318 16FI. Dash 2S. Now, what the heck is all that? So it's 16 Ethernet ports in a plus 2 SFP uplinks. Okay. It is mounted in a weatherproof box. So this is a tower mountable box. Okay. Now you probably would not use it in a tower setting, um, but it is mountable outside. It is a, a NEMA enclosure. Okay. But what it has, it has PoE in or what they call reverse PoE. So they, it actually takes PoE in on 15 of the 16 Ethernet ports. So think about that. Is if you had 15 customers within a mile that you ran Ethernet out with the G-pins, and they're powering this device from their power. So now you have a device that is powered from their power. Um, I did ask them, and they said they'd have to get back with me. I'm like, can one Ethernet, one PoE in power the device, or does it actually have to be two or three? They said it'd probably be multiple, but they would have to check on exactly how many uh, is needed for it to, to stay up. You know, because if you have an area of a mile, I mean, that, you know, from uh, or two miles, one home could be out without power, and the other one could. So, uh, you know, how many do you actually have to have? Uh, it does have a PoE out on a single port. I don't know what that's for, but there you go uh, as well. So that is part of their G-PIN solution so that that allows you to power the uh, switch, then, then do, plug in your fiber and fiber uplink uh, out to wherever you need to go. So you'd be, using, you'd be using the power from the customer instead of vice versa. Correct. And keep in mind, it does have power jacks on it. It's not like you can't power it. Uh, right. from your own UPS, etc. But, uh, again, it does have PoE in ports. Huh. So, 
Um, this is probably the big one that I'm I'm really excited about. Same form factor, CRS 318, same uh, same uh, uh, model number, uh, 16P2S Plus. Uh, this is the probably the the best product that we can get uh, at this point in time. This gives us two 10 gig uplinks uh, and gives us 16 PoE gigabit out ports. So again, if you have a tower that has a whole bunch of stuff on it, tower mountable, outdoor NEMA enclosure, you power it and it powers up to 16 devices. Cool. Uh, very similar to Ubiquity's. Uh, they make that little you know, power box unit that they got. I don't know what that is. And similar to a Natonix? Uh, well, Natonix, Natonix is not NEMA rated. Right. So uh, I think the only other product that's even close to this is the... Uh, power box? Is, is, is that Ubiquity box. I don't remember which one it is, though. So Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have a CSS. Now, this one's Switch OS only. All the other ones, the CRSs, uh, will run router OS or Switch OS. The CSS is switch only uh, OS, eight Ethernet ports with PoE out, and two 10 gig uh, uplinks. Super affordable pricing is what they're saying on this one, uh, even cheaper than the other ones. Uh, and it does have a UPS battery support. So uh, there is a plug on it that you can both monitor the temperature of your battery as well as plug your batteries in for battery backup. So you don't wow, actually have cool. to have a UPS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, uh, obviously, they give us some uh, uh, slides here of uh, each individual unit. Uh, and then they actually go into, like, the 3, uh, 318, 16 Phi. This has the 15 ports, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, the 16 Ethernet, pay, uh, Ethernet ports that 15 of them take PoE in. But you do have a, a, uh, a power jack. You know, a standard barrel connector on top of that makes sense. Question for you. Yep. Will it only feed out what you feed it in, or will it? Uh, can you change voltages? No idea. Okay. You know, my my uh, my assumption is that this is all. Uh, Whatever you feed it. Yeah. Well, you know, the the big thing though is that the the extenders will go up to fifty six volts or fifty seven volts. So my assumption is if you brought 48 volts into one of these, it would take it and be happy. It wouldn't fry the port anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have not asked them that question. So. Right. Um, and then we have the uh, 16P. Uh, the 16P is a little different because we actually have the, the 16 PoE outs. But if you look real carefully, and I'm going to try to zoom in. I don't know if we can see this or not. But we actually have a 48 to 57 voltage out. So if the light is red, then it's 48 to 57 volt. And then over here, maybe, over here, we do have a DC1, which is 18 to 30 volt. And then we have a DC2, 48 volt plug, a barrel connector. So um, this is probably going to follow m most of Microtech's uh, products that they've released so far that supports both 48 and 24 volt is that it'll probably come with a 24 volt power plug. But then if you want 48 volt PoE out, you, have to, you will have to supply your own 48 volt uh, plug to plug that in. Makes sense. Right. So if you feed it with 48, you could get 24 out of it. Uh, uh, the way I the way I understand it is the unit itself runs off 24 volts, so you always have to have 24 volts. That's why it comes with that injector. But if you want high power 48 volt out, then you have to supply it with 48 volt out because that would add that would be eliminating a converter circuit, which would right. eliminate because 48 volt is literally what four times the the wattage. I'm sorry, four times the amperage. Uh, let me try this again. Four times the volts. Uh, the wattage is the same, but uh, it would require <coughs> more wattage uh, to go in. So um, I'm sure that's probably why they did that, mm -hmm. which does make sense. I mean, I can't really fault them. Uh, the word, though, on the... Uh, big the big rack mount switches like the 48 volt PoE out is that those are user selectable and uh, the power supplies will supply 48 and 12 volts so you or 24 volt so you won't have to uh, do anything special on those. Do not quote me on that because I cannot sit there and, and 
guarantee that if that makes sense. Right. So, uh, <coughs> all righty. We got. We still got more. I mean, that's the that's the cool part. Is I mean, they they just went nuts on this. Uh, in in uh, and uh, you know, just did a whole. You know, they they just released a whole crap load of products uh, as well. And this is the the CRS six ten uh, CSS six ten. This is the Switch OS only eight PoE out, which is probably really. It is probably going to be really used because eight PoE out is pretty much what most people need on a tower. Um, you have ten gig in, um, you have DC one, and then you have a separate DC two uh, jack. Uh, so that's what a standard. Uh, uh, then you have an alarm jack, and then you have a UPS jack. Uh, you also have oh, you also have status indicators. I forgot about that. Uh, DC in charging. Uh, and then you have your external temperature probe. Um, so you actually have a lot more power options. And all you have to do is supply a battery, for the most part, on these. So, uh, you know, pretty pretty cool stuff in, in that particular instance, if that makes sense. Ideal for a solar application. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, again, we're going to go back to the G-Pin stuff. Uh, again, I think this slide is kind of out of order. Um, but this is how the G-Pin would work, is that the G-Pin... Uh, sends power to the G-Pin, power to the G-PERS, which is the repeaters, and then would power the CRS-318, and then you can run either optical or Ethernet or wireless, whatever you want, back to your regular network. Um, it does make a, an interesting point that you could either, you know, instead of you running uh, fiber, that you can run... Uh, Ethernet. the The big thing, though, I I see is I don't know what the cost of the GPERS are. Uh, not yet, anyway. And and let me phrase this: even if I did, I couldn't tell anybody. But they have to be really inexpensive. You know, like I don't know, like fifteen bucks or or less, probably. I I I can't sit there and tell you, but um, they have to be really inexpensive because I mean, you're gonna have to have quite a few of them to go uh, a mile with them. Right. You know, so. Uh, and then if you have multiple customers out there, now you actually have to, to figure out how to do that. Uh, what, would be, what would be really neat is if you had a, uh, a gigabit. Very, the difference is this will actually get you a full gig to every home. Uh, if they actually had a Jeeper 2 that you could literally run out to the road, you know, cut the Cat 5, put two ends on it, plug in the Jeeper 2, and then you have a third jack that runs to the home, you know, so that you can just splice into the cable, and it's basically a, a three-port switch. Right. Uh, that would be kind of cool, uh, but uh, you know, we don't we don't know on that. Um, so so we're still we still have more products that they've released. Um, so they have this MQS. This is kind of a an, an oddball product. Um, the way I understand this is this is a uh, PoE out device, super small. Uh, can power a SXT with PoE out, um, and then it has Wi-Fi in it, and that's it. But it doesn't actually have a battery. It actually has to be powered from a power bank or a basically the 5-volt DC connector on it. So now you have a, a power bank such as a, uh, you know, a, a, a cell phone charger that has a battery in it, and then you have to plug this into it, and then you get the same functionality as our power link that basically has everything in it. Um, oh, yeah. I don't really understand this product, but I, I do. I kind of get it, but I don't think it's going to be a big seller, if that makes sense. Um, and it, it, may be, it may be super small, it may be super cheap, uh, and it's, it's made with low power, uh, so it's very, very low power, but uh, I, I don't know. Um, so this is actually kind of a interesting module. This this is what we call LoRa, L O R A, and LoRa is a uh, standard UDP packet forwarder uh, and a standard uh, radio system that they make uh, LoRa devices out there for uh, monitoring wells and uh, pressures and pretty much any type of telemetry monitoring type stuff that I, you could possibly IOT. Need. Yeah, yeah, IOT. 
The problem, though, <laughs> is, is that typically the Laura Gateway is usually, uh, you know, 800 bucks. Okay, and that's what all these LoRa compatible devices talk to. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, what this is, this is basically a WAP. So it's basically built into their WAP uh, enclosure, so they don't have a, a different enclosure. It has a two point uh, two point four gigahertz AP, and it has what we call a LoRa gateway on it. Um, so the whole goal here is that the LoRa devices can communicate with this, and then you can plug in an Ethernet, or you can connect to Wi-Fi, or it can be an access point all at the same time. Um, they are saying this thing is going to be stupid cost compared to other LoRa gateways. Um, so if a WAP is any indication, I'd probably say under 200 and in, in pretty much the, the next cheapest is about 800 So... Uh, again, this is for those Internet of Things. If you have a whole bunch of that, then go for it. But um, we do some of this type of stuff, but not as much as, uh, you know, there, there's definitely companies that they've dedicated themselves to, to you know, IoT types of things. So uh, Next, we have the MUPS Pro. Same form factor as the MUPS. For those of you that do not know, MUPS is a small form factor PoE injector. Uh, supplies 24 volt PoE out, uh, and then has a PoE uh, has an input. Um, then you connect a 24 volt battery, and that's it. It just runs. There's no web interface. There's no nothing on it, uh, and it basically is a small UPS. Well, this is the Pro version. Uh, it's the same form factor. They have added uh, 24 and 48 volt battery support. So if you need a larger battery, you can run 48 volt, and it supports 48 volt PoE out. Uh, plus, somewhere inside there, they tossed in a web interface so you can actually monitor it. Uh, I do not know any other details other than they will probably have SNMP, but it is a, uh, a su it's not Microtech, it's not Router OS or anything like that, um, but it is a, a small web interface, and they're probably going to have SNMP as well inside there. Um, so there you go. Um, so now we have the LHG XLHP. Eesh. Can I add anything more in here? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a simultaneous dual-band router, gigabit Ethernet, and SFP. Um, basically, it gives you... Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what it is, but I believe it's... Uh, it's either 60 and 5 gigahertz. I believe that's what it is. So, basically, it is a... Uh, uh, gives you the simultaneous dual-band so that you can run... Uh, 60 gigahertz, and then if if it fails, then it drops down to uh, uh, 5 gigahertz. Oh, that's uh, sweet. Yeah, high gain, high output, uh, et cetera. So, uh, next and we it's, have... It's not, is it a point-to-point -point application, or could it be point-to-multi-point? Uh, I believe it's point-to-point. -point. Okay. I would not, not believe that it would be capable of doing point-to-multi-point. But, you know, I mean, it, it is a LHG, so it is a high gain directional uh, dish. Right. The grid. So, um, so now we have the power line. So we already have the power line, uh, the power uh, adapters in stock. We've been selling the heck out of them. Um, basically, you plug them in to your home power, and it will form a hundred megabit Ethernet connect connection um, from two units. Very, very simple to set up. Uh, it has a power interf uh, an interface. They run Microtech. They have a uh, they have a, uh, a 2.4 gigahertz AP on this. Um, I was really hoping that they would come out with a 5 gigahertz or a dual band one, but uh, not yet. This uh, is their Ethernet over power line. Product, yeah, right? yeah. Well, they 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 actually have the PWR, which is just the standard. You know, you plug it in, it forms a connection. You have an Ethernet, and then you have the uh, uh, and then you have the uh, Wi-Fi on it, but now mm -hmm. they have this new unit which is called Power Line, and what it does is it actually adds Power Line function via the micro USB. So it will power a Hap Light or a Hap Mini or a Map, uh, you know those types of things, and it will whenever you connect it, it will magically automatically route data over the Ethernet or the micro USB connection. Or it mm. can route data over it. So basically it comes up with another interface whenever you plug it in. So um, 
Again, I don't know exactly what the goal is on these, especially considering some of their other products that we haven't even talked about yet. But um, it is an interesting little little bit, you know. So, so now we are at uh, pretty much one of the uh, most anticipated products, and this is a product called Audience. Uh, yes, that's the name of it. Uh, this is a tri-band home access point. Okay, so it is a tri-band, so it actually has two 5 gigahertz interfaces and 2.4 gigahertz. It has two Ethernet ports. It has a LTE. There is going to be an LTE model with a SIM slot if that's what you want. Um, but the difference is, is that the secondary 5 gigahertz interface pairs with another unit using the Microtech meshing, the HWMP Plus functionality. So the goal with these units are that you can put one where your internet comes in, and then you go put another one at the other end of the house, and it will form and pair directly to each other, and you have a separate 5 gigahertz interface that you're going to connect to, and then you don't get any speed loss. Huh. Okay? So basically it's a, uh, a mesh-type system uh, Full with duplex, a second, huh? second interface. Full duplex. Right. Well, it's not full duplex. It's still 5 gigahertz AC. But the difference is that you're not slowed down by the... Uh, a lot of people want to do the... They, they want to put a repeater out there, but then they use the same radio to, to repeat on as they talk back. And that right. actually slows you down, uh, cuts your speed throughput in, in half. Yeah. So that's uh, that's not what this is designed for. So, um, and uh, we actually had some pictures on there uh, and such about that product. Um, again, it runs router OS, things like that. And the very last thing that uh, Microtech has is this QR code, and uh, you'll have to scan it or something like that. But what this takes you to is a Microtech. Uh, both iPhone and Android official application that will literally log you in uh, and uh, allow you to configure your router through your mobile phone. Uh, and it's available in the uh, the Apple Store as well as the Play Store as well. Hmm. So, uh, and that's it. That's all. <laughs> I mean, that's a crap load. <laughs> it is a, a crap load, anyway, of new products that Microtech has released um, that is eventually going to come down the pipe. Um, like I said, we're going to have to see on the, the, the G-Pin stuff. That's going to be kind of... Keep in mind, over in Latvia and, and over in that area, you know, we, we didn't... Or they never had... Uh, they never had T1s. They did not have these leased carrier lines. There was no such thing. Um, so... When they went from dial-up, they went directly to 100 meg Ethernet. Is basically the only option. So, what happened was is that the you know apartment buildings and things like that they would form an Ethernet network and they'd allow people to share stuff, that type of stuff. And then they get fiber connectivity between buildings or Ethernet connectivity between buildings, and and that's how their quote internet grew. So it is a definite. Uh, it, there's a difference from that product or, or from that system uh, in comparison, if that makes sense. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Just have to be running Ethernet underground instead of uh, fiber. There you go. There you go. Or overhead. Right, right. I mean, it, it's, it is kind of a, an interesting product. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see how well it gets deployed. I mean, I could see it in like a downtown area or something like that, but it's still, the cost is still the same. If you're going to run fiber or Ethernet, I mean, most likely you're going to run fiber. You know, the cable is not what costs. It's the, the, the burying it, you know. And, uh, you know, I was actually looking at that for a new uh, uh, subdivision deployment here in, in St. Louis. And I'm like, I mean, I, I don't see the point other than repairs are cheaper probably and maintenance is probably cheaper. But, again, I, I would almost rather them sit there and say, hey, um, let's do a... You know, still give me a gigabit, but give me give me that three port unit. Uh, I don't think most homes need a gigabit. Uh, however, that's pretty much the way everything's going. So you know, yeah. Uh, everybody has their their own preferences. So, right. 
again, you can a gigabit, they'll never use it. Right, right. You know, uh, again, and, and I just want to make sure I point out again, uh, go to linktechnologiesinc.com. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, go to Linktex uh, Inc. on Facebook and uh, like our page. And, and all this, all the presentation, as well as the link to the live mom, which is on YouTube. Uh, it's probably not, I don't know if it's published yet or not, but all of that is actually already online. Uh, you can view all their products, uh, et cetera, and uh, go from there. So it's been a while since we talked. Any yeah. uh, software developments from Microtech uh, that we need to be concerned about? Uh, you know, so there, there, there have been a few uh, hacks on Microtech. Um, the last one was Yeek. I mean, I know, I know we reported on it. I think it was April of last year uh, or something like that. But there was recently a new one that allows a hacker to... Uh, use a dude agent if installed on the router uh, using A291. They do not gain local access to the router itself, which is really good, but basically allows them to uh, proxy those requests into a private network. And that's this is one of those reasons why NAT is not security. NAT is is bad in in general, but uh, in in today's economy, for the most part, most people are using it, so it it is what it is. The, the issue involved in this one is that, let's say you have a device that has a, a vulnerability like a NAS or something on your home network. Now, all of a sudden, someone from a public Internet can find your Microtech that has the dude agent installed uh, and then can relay those requests to other IPs, including the one that your NAS is sitting on, the private IP, and then infiltrate that device, and then they have access to the whole network. Mm -hmm. Um 643.12, I believe, is whenever they fix that. Uh, 644 also has a good fix uh, for that as well. Uh, I'd recommend everybody just upgrading to 644 because that seems to be the uh, the simplest method anyway. Uh, definitely works really, really good. Um, other than that, I mean, they've been making other improvements. Uh, the kid control stuff is still, still working. Uh, they're still developing that. Uh, looks really good. Uh, I noticed they put a speed test uh, in command line there. Uh, well, there's always been a speed test. They actually added multi-threading to their speed test uh, because they actually had devices that need multi-threading. Imagine that. <laughs> Especially whenever you get the 10 and 40 gig E interfaces. So uh, those are, are very important. Um, I mean, otherwise, there has to be a very specific use case for the, the feature set that they've, they've fixed. Um, they did backport all of their uh, bridge stuff, all their switch functionality into uh, 632, 633, somewhere in there. That was last year. Um, that really didn't have too many issues. I did not see too many issues with that. So um, probably one of the, the other things, uh, as far as Microtech is concerned, uh, again, having the, the mobile app is really neat. Uh, I don't know how well it's going to be deployed or used, but they'll have those statistics. I'm sure we'll see those statistics next year. Um, you know, it, 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 and again, I'll be asking a lot more of these questions at the uh, the MUM in uh, Austin as well, and I'll hopefully can bring you guys back some type of feedback um, to get kid to get more information back from everybody. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So, um, other than that, everything else is uh, you know we're we're doing. Microtech has released a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know. I, I know some of the stuff was needed. The the 16 and the 8 port PoE out inside an email enclosure, dude. That that's awesome. Yes. Uh, you know those those are are probably really really uh, sought after. Uh, mm -hmm. I was really. I see a lot of comments that people was really hoping for uh, Microtech to release. A new cloud core or version, the the mythical uh, version seven. Um, mm -hmm. um, I did see some people talking about BGP performance in router OS, and uh, yes, there is a quote performance issue. Um, it really kind of comes down to how you're using it, uh, how many routes you're taking, uh, as well as what else are you doing on the router. Uh, this is mostly for their CCRs. Uh, the BGP inside uh, the CHR or XA6 version is not as bad. They they still have the same limitations. The difference is, is that we have a uh, much larger 
per core processing power. Uh, so that's really important to note. Uh, but with the like the the 1072, I mean, you got like a one gigahertz core, and that's it. So because of that, we can't do as much as a three gigahertz or a four gigahertz core. Imagine that. Um, so that's one of those issues. But it really depends on what is your acceptable level of of uh, not necessarily downtime, but invalid routes or routes being invalid. Um, right. Basically, I have seen CHRs ingest the entire table and be up to date within 30 seconds. Uh, a CCR is going to take about five minutes. Okay. However, is five minutes horrible? I, again, it depends on how you look at it. Is is it worth you spending a whole bunch of money to buy a uh, Power Hour 2200 to run ESXi, then run CHR, uh, etc., or just buy a $3,000 uh, 1072. The question is, is at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. when one of your BGP peers goes down, does it take 30 seconds or does it take 5 minutes? And does it fix itself? The... the, the the question is, is, what is the acceptable level of performance that you actually need out of it? And I always sit there and say, it's up to you. If you want to do the CHR, we can help you with that. If you want us to do the CCR, we can do that. You just have to understand that it's going to take you five minutes to recover from a down BGP link. And, uh, and it's not completely down. It's just that BGP link has failed. The BGP has to uninstall that table. It's going to take about five minutes. Okay, uh -huh. that's going to be to uninstall the pa uninstall those routes and reactivate and recompare routes and activate the routes that are needed. So, will there be a time? Will Google be unavailable for five minutes? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Somewhere in there, probably. Okay, but again, the the solution or the problem gets resolved in a decent amount of time, or I think a decent amount of time. Um, it really depends on what your level of service is with those companies or with right. your clients. So yep. uh, there you go. Um, there was also something else I'd love to talk about. Uh, we use the Dude for a lot of monitoring. And for all of its uh, issues that they, that they have with it, it actually works really well. Uh, it can do a lot extremely, extremely well. It can monitor... Uh, you know, pretty much anything with SNMP you can monitor, which is really good. Um, but I was interested in a little bit more granular data, um, stuff that uh, both Windows and Linux boxes have that is not exposed to SNMP. So, uh, what do you what do you use, uh, Steve? I've got the dude sitting on a CCR, but I use PowerCode for all my monitoring. Okay, so. There's a new, uh, it's not new, it's, it's actually in version 4, but there's a product called Zabbix, and uh, it's uh, completely free. They offer a ISO that is, uh, that will work for, uh, or with a installation, so you can install the CD, plug, plug a flash drive, mount the ISO, and boot from that ISO, and it will install, it will self-install, and everything will be running. That's the difference. It is a Linux OS. Um, but the the monitoring it is extremely good. Uh, we have started using it at Link Technologies, uh, and we're still using the dude. So keep in mind we we are still using the dude because we have not dropped that off yet. But uh, one of the differences is that let's say you have a, uh, a CCR that has a one gig link to a Mimosa radio. One of the one of the big problems that those originally had and still have at somewhat some 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 shape or fashion today is they like to drop to 100 meg i've okay. seen it right and uh the dude can monitor that through snmp polling but it doesn't monitor it very well uh every device is different things like that well Zabbix understands that there are different interfaces, and each interface has different val values and how to read the SNMP profile. So the difference is that 
whenever you load Zabbix and you say start monitoring this SNMP device, it sits there and basically takes a, an SMP snapshot and says, okay, I have this interface at a gigabit. If that changes, I'm going to set up a trigger automatically that will alert somebody. That beco it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, recently we actually had a issue where uh, the backup that we were doing on our transaction logs in SQL was not causing... Uh, it was not set up correctly, so it was not causing the transaction log to shrink like it should. So within about a week, uh, we had a transaction log that was about you know, 380 gigish in size. A nice large transaction log, which is not something you really want. Um, you know, you would like to commit that data. You want to back that up, and then you want to commit that data to the database so that you have that information. Um, the issue in this particular case was it was running us out of free space on our drive. So right. uh, all of a sudden, I get an alert and a problem that says, hey, there's less than 20% disk space left. And, and less than 20% is usually more than enough time that, hey, I can go find out what the problem is. And I found this transaction log, and I ended up shrinking it like I should. So we basically lobbed that. It went from uh, 380 gig down to, like, 20 meg, as it should. Um, right. But the difference was that it alerted me of a problem I didn't even think about monitoring for, um, and it prevented an issue before it became an issue. And that's with Zabbix. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, so we we are we are doing some Zabbix programming. We do we do that quite a bit now. Uh, not a whole lot, but we do quite a bit of it. Uh, it does work really good. You have wonderful dashboards. Um, so like on towercoverage.com, I have our uh, SQL servers, all of their CPUs. I have how much RAM they're using uh, and how much is free. I have the disk queue length, which is a big thing in SQL. Uh, I then have my web server CPU load. I then, and, and we have multiple web servers, so I have all of them on one chart. Uh, I then have my memory usage all on one chart for my web servers. Uh, I also have my disk read and write queue links from all of my web servers, all in, again, one chart. And that's what's really neat is that you can sit there and build any of these type, these chart uh, things uh, inside your dashboard. Uh, and then I actually monitor the number of uh, web connections that come in on each web server, and it adds all those up and shows them uh, as well. So um, it's really neat to see how everything interacts. Uh, like all of our processing servers, I have all the processing server CPU load in one chart, which is really good because it really, uh, if one CPU is high or something like that, it really stands out. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, uh, and then you could also monitor, uh, and again, it's it's very, very analytical. You can actually sit there and build all these charts. It is not as intuitive as you would think it is, or it needs to be. But once you kind of get past that hurdle, uh, you, you'll you'll really like it. Um, you know, we we pretty much chart you know, almost everything with it now, uh, and it has agents, which is something the dude doesn't have. Uh, the the dude has a relay agent, but Zabbix actually has both a Linux and a Windows agent that you can install, and then it can go grab other things. Um, so uh, if you install a Zabbix Windows agent on a Windows box and uh, you just did the bank, the blank install and then ad added that item or that, that host to your uh, Zabbix server, uh, one of the first things you'll probably get within a day is you're going to get like the Windows installer has stopped. Okay, well... That was because whenever it was installed, it took that snapshot, it was <coughs> running, and now you've done your Windows updates, and now the Windows installer service stopped. It's supposed to start and stop. That's the whole point. But the difference is, is it knew to alert somebody about it, at least by default. And whether or not that's good or bad, you know, I go in, I just go in the configuration, I turn off that, that alert or that trigger because I don't want that to sit there and pop up anymore. But if... SQL stops or, uh, you know, some other service stops, I want to know about it. And like I said, especially with the problems, you know, the, the whole thing with the problems is you only want to know what broke. You don't really want, you know, all the statistical data is great, 
but if you actually get what's actually broke, that actually really, really helps out. Or what's coming close to breaking. Yes, yes. So, and like I said, I mean, uh, the port speed change, that's that's awesome. The port the port has stopped working. That's a whole other one. Uh, when we set it up on our, our local router here, we have a whole bunch of CAP interfaces for our wireless APs. And whenever people get off the CAPs, they go, uh, the, the interface goes as not running anymore. It literally alerts me of those that, hey, this interface is not running anymore because guess what? Nobody's connected to it. I don't right. really need to know that because I know which interface it is, but if it was a main backhaul, I'd probably want to know about it. For sure. So, And that's one of those things that, uh, especially as you get into a larger OSPF or redundant network, that you need, you know, by you just monitoring the devices, all the devices are online, but you may have a link that's off. And that's why, you know, you actually need a little bit more than just state monitoring or stateful monitoring, which is, you know, I can ping these devices, that means they're online. You actually need to know if something changed. Well, yeah, like, uh, for example, today we're in a heavy wind situation, and the link still shows up, but it's uh, modulated down because the antenna turned. This is something that would inform you of that? Um, the answer would be if you if you can select it inside a variable, then most likely yes. So if uh, I have not started monitoring uh, signal strength, my assumption is you can. So you can actually monitor and chart signal strength, which is charting your history is really good. But then you would have to go in and make a trigger that says, hey, if this signal falls below X, Y, Z threshold, I want you to alert me. Right. So uh, I have not done that yet. I'm, I guarantee you that it can be done. It's just a matter of uh, programming it to, to do that. And it does require a little knowledge uh, on, on those types of contexts, but it does work, and it works quite well. Hmm. Or so far, anyway, it works quite well, anyway. You know? Right. So it's just a matter of uh, you know putting putting one plus one into two and uh, you know going going from there if that makes sense. Sure. So, uh, but that's that's about it. Um, you know I'll see everybody at uh, Wisp America next week. Uh, I'll see all of our Canadian uh, customers uh, at Can Can Wisp in two weeks, and I'll see all the Microtech users in three weeks. <laughs> well, it sounds like a. a, a a busy schedule for you. I hope you have a safe trip uh, everywhere you go. And if that's it, I think we can wrap it up. All Thanks right. a lot for telling us all about the latest and greatest of Microtech. I'll definitely go check it out on your Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a lot of really good data. Um, you know, a lot of this information, you know, they're going to release at the, the Austin Mum as well. Uh, and then they'll they'll have the product demos, uh, you know, their, their prototypes. And that's when really I get to go there and say, okay, how how do you envision the G pin to work with power and, and all these other odd questions that most people may not ask. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um you know, th those are kind of kind of interesting. And then uh the other thing is, you know, how does the forty eight volt work uh PoE out on the big switches as well as the, the C C R S's and such so there's definitely right. some questions and uh We'll ask him and go from there. Well, cool. Well, if you want to wrap us up, Dennis, uh, thanks for listening to ISP Radio this week. And look forward to doing another show for you here short, soon. Thanks a lot. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to ISP Radio. We hope you've gained new insights and additional wisdom in our industry as well as your business. Please remember to visit our show sponsors via the links on ISPRadio.com. If you're interested in becoming a show sponsor, contact us at sales at ispradio.com. Now go out there and push those packets as fast as you can. Good luck and Godspeed.